So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, special Research Tuesdays forum, Stem Cells Extracting the Facts. Adelaide-based researchers have been at the cutting edge of stem cell research since as long as I can remember, certainly since it exploded onto the scientific scene about well, over two decades ago. So tonight we're able to have with us three outstanding University of Adelaide stem cell researchers who will cast light on every aspect of this exciting field uh, uh, area of medical research. They are Professor Andrew Zanatino, Professor Stan Gronthos and Dr Michelle Lane. This evening we'll begin by hearing uh, short presentations from each of our speakers. Uh, firstly, Michelle will take us through the history of stem cell research and will cover the creation of the first human embryonic stem cells. Andrew will take us through uh, the use of adult stem cells, including therapeutic advantages and limitations. Uh, then Stan will take us through some of the new technology and emerging uh, abilities of induced plur pluripotent stem cells. The presentations will be followed by a panel discussion where we'll delve a little deeper into their research and some of the ethical issues surrounding the area. And I'll then invite, the, the exciting bit for you is I'll then invite questions from the audience. So first let me introduce Dr Michelle Lane. Michelle is an NH and MRC uh, Senior Research Fellow based at the University's Robinson Research Institute where she is Head of the Gamete and, and uh, Embryo Biology Laboratory. Her main research interest is understanding how environmental insults impact gametes to alter the development of the embryo. In the area of stem cells, Michelle had the remarkable experience of being involved in the creation of the world's first human embryonic stem cells. This was at the University of Wisconsin in conjunction with Professors Thompson and Jones. Michelle has extensive translation and clinical experience, having many products sold worldwide with eight awarded patents in the field of clinical IVF and cryopreservation of stem cells. She's published over 170 peer-reviewed papers, more than 30 book chapters, and she's edited two books. Please welcome Michelle. So thank you for everyone for coming and particularly for deciding that we're more interesting to listen to than Joe Hockey, so we, we appreciate that. <laughs> So I'm going to start by talking about embryonic stem cells and I'm just going to give a little bit of a snapshot of some background and talk about how they've come about, what, um, what their potential is and give a little bit of an update of where we are in terms of uh, their current sort of application today. So let's start with what is a stem cell. So essentially stem cells are distinguished from other cell types by two main characteristics and that is that they're capable of renewing themselves so that they can um, continue to be immortal and, and, and divide and renew themselves and also that they can be induced to actually become particular cells. So you can actually send them down a particular differentiation cell line to make them become a certain cell type. And some examples are that I've listed here is things such as neural cells and cardiac cells. So what is an embryonic stem cell? Well, an embryonic stem cell is a stem cell that we generate from the pluripotent cells of the embryo. And they are quite unique and an exciting tool in terms of their potential in that they have the capacity to essentially form any cell in the body because they come from the initial embryo. So therefore, in terms of, of what we might be able to do with them, is that they represent a potential renewable source of, tr of cells to treat disease. And that's really where the interest and um, the drive to create the stem cells came from. So when I talk about an embryonic stem cell, what do, do, what, what do we mean in terms of the pluripotency of the embryo? So I've got here a diagram uh, that shows the different stages of embryo development. Now, if we start off with here, you can see this is the um, early embryo just after fertilisation. You can see the pronuclear here, which is the DNA material from the male and the female. And what happens is, is then this embryo divides, forms what we call a morula, and then it begins to differentiate. And this is the blastocyst. And this is the stage right before implantation. So what you can see in this embryo here is it has some cells on the outside, which are the cells that will go on and essentially inform, invade into the endometrium and form the placenta and all the extra embryonic tissues. And these cells on the inside are the pluripotent cells. It's called the inner cell mass. And they're the cells that we actually isolate when we're talking about making human embryonic stem cells. And within, those, within that inner cell mass and those cells in the middle there, you can see that 
not all the cells are the pluripotent cells, there's just a handful of them. And we can identify them by looking at certain cell markers. So in, in this case, we're looking at Nanog. And what you can see in these embryos is you can see the cells that are positive for Nanog. So these are the cells that we can isolate for creating human embryonic stem cells or embryonic stem cells. And you can see here that the number of these cells differs in different embryos. And I'm going to come back to why that might be significant in a minute. So essentially what we do is we can take those um, these blastocysts and certainly the first embryonic stem cells that, we, that were isolated from the mouse were from embryos that we flushed out of um, the uterus. You can take these cells that are the inner cell mouse cells, you can plate them out into a plate, give them certain factors that we know are really important for maintaining their pluripotency and allowing them to divide and self-renew. And then you can essentially expand them up into millions and millions of cells which you can then um, either store or differentiate. So the first, as I said, the first human, uh, the first mouse um, embryonic stem cells were from, generated from the mouse and that was in 1981. And it was actually 17 years before the first human embryonic stem cells were um, able to generate it. And really a lot of that was about our inability to actually grow the embryo. Because in the mouse we could flush a blastocyst stage embryo from the uterus but we obviously can't do that in the human. And so this gap in terms of generating the stem cells was more or less a gap in terms of our capacity to grow human embryos in culture. And so the first human embryonic stem cells were derived by Jamie Thompson and um, uh, Jeff Jones from the University of Wisconsin. And what they did is they were able to take human blastocysts, they took out those inner cell mass from 14, they managed to take out uh, inner cell mass from 14 blastocysts, and from that they derived five uh, human embryonic cell lines. And then, so this is a picture of the, uh, of the um, embryonic stem cells. You can see they form what we call colonies and you can grow these colonies and this is a couple of different cell lines. And you can see that they're very different in terms of their morphology, their shape and how they look compared to what we call the feeder layer which is the fibroblast cells on the outside. So the really cool thing about stem cells is, as I said, is that they can differentiate into all sorts of cells in the body. And the initial experiments that, that were done um, back in 1998 were that they put these uh, stem cells into a, they injected into a mouse and they let the stem cells just differentiate in a, in a manner, in any way they want. So it's completely uncontrolled. And then they look to see what's, what different cells. And they are able to see that these stem cells could form cardiac cells, neural cells. Sometimes when you look down a dish, it's really cool. You can almost see little cells sort of beating like it's, um, you know, like cardiac cells, um, like it would be in a heart. But what, in the last, since those stem cells were generated, where a lot of the research has been focused in the last, um, since then really, is understanding how to take those stem cells and differentiate them in a directed way. So rather than just injecting them and letting them you know, form whatever type of cell they want, it's about learning all the biological processes that we can take a stem cell and say, I want it to be a neural cell and be able to make that happen. And that has taken, and it's still going, is where a lot of the research is happening these days. And it is now possible to actually take stem cells and begin to, to create specific cells. A few of um, examples that, that I have on this slide here, making islet cells which might be able to treat diabetes. You can see some neural cells which the idea being is they might be able to treat um, spinal cord injury and other examples here. So we're learning more and more about these cells and how to differentiate them all the time. So what is their potential? Well, their potential is, is that if you can differentiate a stem cell and make it into any cell you like, then you do have an, you, you have an unlimited supply of cells because they also self-generate. You can actually make as many neural cells as you want, as many cardiac cells as you want. And the idea is that you could use those cells then and transplant them back into um, and cure disease. And I've listed a couple of examples here where in actual fact there are current clinical trials are going on where they're actually looking at ways to use human embryonic stem cells to treat some dis different disorders and also in the testing of drugs. And the reason why testing of drugs with human embryonic stem cells is good is that you can test all sorts of drugs on specific cell types. So again, you can make a dish of all the types of cells that you would like and you can test the drugs and the impact of the drugs. And there's a lot of work being done in terms of, of that sort of um, application. There's, there's now... Um, that's, 
so and also in terms of the clinical trials. So the first clinical trial was, was approved in 2009 and as, as I said, there's a, a few different ways. As of today, there's 307 cell lines that are actually in the NIH registry, um, human embryonic cell lines, which can be used to actually do this sort of research. And the other interesting thing that has come around another application for many of these um, cell lines is that we can now many of the cell lines that we've made in terms of human embryonic cell lines are from embryos with a particular disease. And so patients will donate a, an embryo that maybe has been uh, tested uh, and found to carry something, a, a genetic mutation, cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease or any, anything else like that. They'll donate that to research. And then what you can do then is we can make stem cells that actually have this genetic disorder, we can differentiate those into all different cell types and we begin to understand the biology of that disease and we can also understand how the different cellular processes work in those um, sorts of cells. And about half of the cell lines that are now in the NIH registry are actually from embryos that carry some sort of um, genetic disorder. So this is just one example of a, a clinical trial um, that has been carried out. There's actually um, two phase one clinical trials that have been carried out for macular degeneration. And essentially, this is where they have, they take the stem cells, they grow them up in the lab, and then they inject them into the back of the eye with the view of improving sight. That's the, that's the ultimate gain. And there's been a couple of different publications that um, have shown that not only can you just inject these, these cells into, uh, you know, into an animal that might have some of these disorders, but they've also been able to use these cells to begin to create 3D-like structures as well. So that's, it's all very exciting in terms of what we might be able to do with these cells. So one of the limitations is of the use of these cells is to be able to differentiate them into the particular cell that we like and be able to make sure that that cell is normal in, in, in the way that it would normally appear in the body. But obviously in terms of human embryonic stem cells, there is significant ethical concerns. And that is um, one of the reasons that there has not been a huge amount of research done in this area, really considering that the first embryonic stem cells were generated in, um, you know, essentially 15, 20 years ago. And that's because a lot of countries actually don't permit very much research in this area for obvious reasons. And in some, and in some places, you, it's very difficult to do this kind of research. And the reason is, is because we do source the cells from excess human embryos. And usually these embryos are excess from fertility treatment, often in terms of the normal cell lines, they are excess in terms of normal embryos that would have the capacity to, to produce a baby or potentially have the capacity to produce a baby. And these are the cells that we, and we have to destroy those embryos essentially to get those inner cell mass cells out. Or they might be, um, embryos that where the patients have actually undergone some sort of pre-genetic pre, um, diagnosis before implantation um, and we can create stem cells from that. So the patients will donate them for research and one of the other um, considerations that we have is what we call derivation efficiencies is that not all the embryos that are donated for research for this are going to generate a, um, a cell line and a cell line that, that actually will be normal karyotypically. I mean, about 50% of all, all blastocysts are, are karyotypically normal anyway. Um, so they would have um, aneuploidies, uh, trisomy 21 or something like that. So we wouldn't really be able to use, they wouldn't be a normal cell line anyway. And as I pointed out earlier, the number of those pluripotent cells in those blastocysts is, is incredibly variable from zero to some embryos having, you know, maybe 10 cells out of the 100 is sort of the maximum that you would get. And so it's not always possible to create stem cell lines and you do have to use quite a few embryos before you can actually get a successful um, embryonic stem, stem cell line. So that has resulted in really the a development of other fields in terms of stem cells and we're going to hear about some of these today um, including adult stem cells as well as iPS cells. All of these stem cell uh, um, approaches all have some limitations um, and some benefits um, but in terms of human embryonic stem cells that's sort of where we are. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, Andrew who, um, oh, first I need to acknowledge um, Professor Mark Noddle, who I do a lot of work with and has actually supplied several of the slides uh, that I've used here tonight. Thanks, Michelle. That's a, a terrific introduction to the, the concept of taking, uh, the concept of um, embryonic stem cells in the first place and of turning them into uh, different types of specialised cells. 
Our next speaker is Professor Andrew Zanatino. Andrew is Professor of Experimental Haematology and is the Deputy Head of the School of Medical Sciences. He's a member of the University's Centre for Personalised uh, Cancer Medicine and also holds a professorial appointment at, uh, with the Royal Adelaide Hospital Cancer Centre. In addition to his academic commitments, Andrew heads the Myeloma Research Laboratory and co-heads the Regenerative Medicine Program. This program stems from collaborative studies with Stan Gronthos, our third speaker, and Paul Simmons, which led to the patenting of technologies around identification and isolation of mesenchymal precursor cells. The family of seven patents surrounding this technology, of which, uh, of which Andrew is a substantive inventor, underpin the world's largest cell therapy company, Mesoblast Limited. No, no small achievement. Andrew has received over $12 million in research funding, has been awarded 16 NHMRC grants and has co-authored uh, more than 145 publications. Please join me in welcoming Andrew. Thanks, Rob. He actually made me sound rather good. Thank you, Rob. You can do that any time. Look, welcome and uh, thank you for your attendance this evening. Like uh, um, was Michelle said earlier, it's, uh, we're, we're up against the budget, so uh, thanks for coming out this evening. Um, We've heard about embryonic stem cells. I'm going to take you through some of our research that we've done with adult stem cells. And I'm going to try and leave you with the message that adult stem cells can be used for regenerative purposes. So I wanted to start by reminding all of you in the audience that we're a complex organism and we're made up of many different types of cells. And at last count, we're actually comprised of about 220 different types of mature cells. And these are recognisable cells, they have muscle cells and nerve cells and skin cells. And as you would all appreciate, while some cells do remain with us for our lifetime, such as cells of the brain, most of the cells in our body actually require renewal on a constant basis, with some of the cells of our immune system, for example, only lasting for a few days, while some cells, such as red blood cells, can last up to 120 days. And as I mentioned earlier, some of our cells can last a lifetime. But generally speaking, they're turned over uh, as, we, as we live. And as a consequence, we actually need cells within our body that actually have stem cell characteristics. So we have now come to the realisation that most of the mature cells in our body are derived ultimately from adult stem cells postnatally. Uh, the concept of an adult stem cell is not new. We like to think we, we came up with everything in the last five years, but the truth is, the adult stem cell concept was actually first postulated by a German scientist by the name of Arthur Pappenheim. And he postulated this to account for the fact that we actually need to replace these short-lived cells in our tissues. And this was actually furthered by the work of Alexander Maximov and Ernst Newman, who actually also used the term stem cells to describe cells that were responsible for replacing our bone marrow and our blood system. So how do we define an adult stem cell? We can turn to the Oxford Dictionary, and the Oxford Dictionary tells us it's an undifferentiated cell found in tissues that can renew itself, and within certain limitations can actually differentiate to yield specialised cells found in the tissues that they originated from. So what I've shown here is the adult stem cell has one of a couple of decisions to make. It can actually make a copy of itself, and that's known as self-renewal, or alternatively, if it takes on different cues, it can actually differentiate toward a specialised cell type, one of these mature cell types like a nerve cell or a red blood cell, for example. Since those first descriptions of an adult stem cell, we now know that adult stem cells actually exist in essentially all of our mature organs in our body and, and tissues. The brain has them, the heart has them, as does the bone marrow. The common feature of adult stem cells is that they're very rare usually and they're often very, very difficult to, to identify and isolate. And generally speaking, they have a limited potential to differentiate only into those cells that, from the tissue from which they're derived. However, there has been some reports of what we term plasticity, where cells, for example, from the bone marrow are actually capable of differentiating into, say, a heart cell or a liver cell. But generally speaking, they have a much more limited potential than such as an embryonic stem cell which can develop into an entire organism. So have we been using stem cells, adult stem cells, for therapy? Well, in fact, we've been doing this for some years now. And in fact, the first example of the use of an adult stem cell comes from the work 
in the 1950s and 1958 by a French oncologist by the name of Georges Math, who actually performed the first bone marrow transplant. And he did this into, took marrow from individuals and then transplanted it into patients who had actually uh, had their bone marrow damaged by exposure to, to radiation. And that actually caused irreversible stem cell depletion. And this was followed by work in 1968 by Robert Good, who actually performed a transplant from a young girl into her little brother, into her sibling, a five-month-old boy who had a severe combined immunodeficiency, a genetic disorder that affected his immune system. And this was ultimately followed by work that was done by Don Thomas, and Don actually did work where he actually took marrow from a sibling and actually transplanted it into a sibling with, say, leukaemia. And in fact, 50,000 transplants are performed each year around the world based on these work that was done more than a half, or more than a half century ago. So what are the cells responsible for replacing the bone marrow? Well, they're known as hematopoietic stem cells. It's a big word, but it just means blood stem cell. And these stem cells are remarkable. They live in our marrow, and they are responsible for generating upwards of 500 billion cells per day, which is a staggering number of cells. I can't even get my head around that, but that's an enormous number of cells. And these cells include all those ones that we find in our blood, and in our tissues, such as red blood cells and the immune, fight, immune cells, such as neutrophils and eosinophils. And these are made all by these hematopoietic stem cells, which are rare, but found in our marrow. In addition to hematopoietic stem cells, the bone marrow actually contains another stem cell population. And this was first described in the late 60s, early 70s, by a Russian scientist by the name of Alexander Friedenstein and a British scientist known as Maureen Owen. And they actually identified another stem cell population in the marrow when they actually took marrow suspensions and plated it into a tissue culture flask. And what they found that in addition to those hematopoietic stem cells and the, and the blood cells, they also found at the bottom of the flask these little colonies that formed, as you can see here, stained in purple. And they found these colonies, they're all different sizes, and they are formed from a single cell which divides and proliferates to form a colony of these fibroblast-like cells. These were extremely rare, found in about one in a hundred thousand cells in the marrow. And what they also were able to demonstrate is that each of these colonies had a different proliferative potential or capacity to divide and form new cells and a different ability to form connective tissues, such as bone, fat, muscle, and uh, cartilage. <coughs> So they proposed that like the hematopoietic stem cell system, which gives rise to all of our blood, the connective tissue of our marrow is actually maintained by another stem cell population, which we now call a mesenchymal or mesenchymal stem cell. And these mesenchymal stem cells can differentiate into a variety of cell types, such as muscle, fat, the bone forming osteoblasts, and the cartilage forming chondrocytes. However, it wasn't really until the work in the 90s, in the early to mid 90s, that was performed by myself and my colleague Stan Gronthos, who will be talking to you soon, and also uh, 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 Paul Simmons, where we were able to isolate for the first time these stem cells from directly from the bone marrow. And to do this, we relied on an antibody, which is really just a tool that sticks to another protein that's present on the cell surface. This antibody only bound to mesenchymal stem cells and it did not bind to hematopoietic stem cells or other mature blood elements. So this for the first time gave us the ability to extract from marrow these stem cells and we developed techniques to do this at very high efficiency. And what this really shows us here in this little graph here shows that all of the colony forming potential was exclusively in that stro one positive fraction of the bone marrow. What we're able then to show is that these cells also had the ability to form a variety of tissues, including fat and cartilage and bone. And that got us to thinking that perhaps we could use these cells for a therapy. So the first type of thing we thought about was to repair bones. And in the audience, I'm sure there's somebody who's broken a bone at some stage in their life. And generally speaking, we have it cast and between six and eight weeks, the bone is healed and repaired and everyone's happy. 
However, there are circumstances where you lose probably more than 5% of your bone length and it doesn't repair, it's unable to repair. And that's actually the formation of what we call a non-union or a segmental defect of bone. And this is a really nice example of that where you can see there's a massive amount of bone loss here that under normal circumstances won't heal properly. So we thought perhaps we could use these stem cells to try and heal segmental defects or these non-union defects. So I'm going to warn you, anyone who's a little bit squeamish, probably turn away for the next slide because what I'm going to show you is a slide where we have done some animal experimentation. So please turn away and it was done in sheep. So we took sheep, we, um, and that's an example of sheep wearing sunglasses as you can see here, we isolated the bone marrow. We then used our technology and our techniques to actually isolate those mesenchymal stem cells from the marrow. We then took those cells into the laboratory, expanded them in number. We then at the same time had our veterinary surgeon actually create a segmental defect and you can probably see that nicely here where there's a three centimetre section of the bone that's been removed. And then what we've done is we've hollowed out the bone marrow and we've inserted an intramedullary nail or a rod and that actually allows for the bone to actually um, to be maintain its integrity. We then, in half of the animals, we took a material, a little matrix material that we wrapped around that area of bone loss and we just injected saline into that material. And in the other half of the animals, we actually injected stem cells into that matrix material and then wrapped it around that nail. And then we let the sheep go out to paddock and we brought them in for an x-ray at 3, 6 and 12 months. And what you can see in the next slide is the sort of results that we found. On the left hand panel where the animals didn't receive any stem cells, you can still see that after 6 months there's no bone formation and the material that you're seeing between there is actually that matrix material that's actually showing up white. But there is really no bone healing after 6 months in these sheep. However, what you can see on the right, when these animals received 225 million stem cells, what we were able to do was to repair that bone completely. And that's shown, I think, really well in that CT scan here, where the bone looks extremely normal. In fact, it had very good load-bearing capacity and essentially was a normal piece of bone thereafter. So we have, based on these, these data, based on these data, we were able to think, perhaps we could move this work into the clinic. And it, as you can appreciate, moving laboratory findings into the clinic is not cheap. So the best approach that we thought was perhaps we could initiate or st form a company to uh, enable the, this work to move into the clinic. So based on the seven patents that Stan and I developed with, along with Paul Simmons, this work was then taken up by a company which is an Australian stock exchange listed company called Mesoblast Limited, which has enabled us to really move very rapidly this work into the clinic and this company was established in 2004 and since that Stan and I have been working very closely with this company to move the, the, uh, the, the clinical application of these cells forward. What we also did during that last 10 years was to develop these techniques that we had in the laboratory and upscale them, move them into a laboratory environment which enabled us to produce a clinical grade stem cell. So this slide just really shows you how we've gone about that. We've actually developed techniques which allow us to do large scale preparations of the stem cells to actually then take them into a, what we call an ultra clean, good manufacturing practice laboratory. And this laboratory environment enables us to produce these cells to FDA and TGA standards, the Food and Drug Administration standards, which is the body that oversees all these new therapies uh, in, in the US and the TGA in Australia. And so this technology has allowed us to isolate a pure stem cell population. We can efficiently upscale the production and we can make many billions of cells in the laboratory and we can freeze them down into small usable sizes. And these are stored in liquid nitrogen until they're required. And we have ensured that there is batch, batch, batch to batch consistency and the cells are actually clinically applicable. So this is the first experiment that we did in humans. So this is the first clinical trial. It was done here in Australia at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And it was under the auspices of, of a surgeon by the name of Richard de Steiger who performed the surgeries. Uh, what we did here was recruit patients who had uh, a non-union that had persisted for more than six months. And in fact, the patient, there was one patient whose non-union hadn't healed for up to 41 months. We then implanted stem cells into these patients 
and the median number of cells that the, the patients received was about 111 million, but some patients received many more, 212 million, and that was really largely dependent on the size of the segmental defect that, would, that the, the patient had. The good news was that nine out of the 10 patients who we treated with the stem cells actually achieved a union where they hadn't done so before, and that the time to union was around 18 weeks, and we also showed, most importantly, that there was, the cells were extremely safe and there were no adverse events. This is the first chap who received the stem cells. He's a 20-year-old Melbourneian who liked fast motorcycles. And he came off his motorcycle one day and he smashed up his thigh bone, his, his femur. And as you can see here, this is an X-ray of his distal femur where he's lost a lot of bone, as you can see. And this is six months after the... I think, sorry, I apologise, it was 12 months after the accident. And as you can see, there's no bone growth in that area of the distal femur. However, just after three months of implantation of those stem cells, we've actually been able to regrow his bone. The guy's bone is now fully healed, and believe it or not, he's back on his motorcycle. So there you go. <laughs> Some people probably don't ever learn. So based on these studies, and also I should have mentioned an enormous number of laboratory studies and also a range of animal studies, we wanted to move these stem cells into a variety of different disease settings. And so we've done that, and the first one I wanted to show you beyond the bone was, was our studies in heart. As most of you know, um, heart failure and ischemic heart disease accounts for about 20% of the deaths of Australians each year. So this is one area that we wanted to see whether we could actually make an, uh, you know, have some effect. So as many of you in the audience would know, when you have a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, there is a lot of heart cell death that occurs. And this ultimately leads the heart to wanting to maintain its functionality so it starts to essentially enlarge and we actually get a cardiomyopathy which ultimately leads to heart failure. So we thought if we could inject the stem cells directly into the area of damaged heart, that would be one way that we could see whether we could affect you know, at least some reparative process. And fortuitously, Johnson & Johnson had developed a technology known as electromechanical mapping, uh, which allowed us to transendocardially deliver the mesenchymal stem cells to the area of affected heart. So most of you would have heard of an angiogram or angi angiography. This allows a catheter to be put through the femoral artery right into the heart. And we had a little injection catheter at the end of it, which enabled us to inject the cells into areas which showed very little mechanical activity as well as electrical conductivity. So we knew that was the area that was damaged. So that enabled us to do these studies where we injected cells into, into the patient's heart. And the results were remarkable, frankly. What we found is that after a heart attack, the ability of the heart to pump, as shown here by this dotted line, decreases over time. You inject stem cells into the heart, into the area that is damaged, and what you find is that you either increase or maintain the level of functionality that you would see normally at the, prior to a heart attack. And in parallel animal studies, we wanted, to wonder, we wanted to know how this was occurring. So in parallel animal studies, we were able to demonstrate the way this was working was that the stem cells were stimulating new blood vessels being formed in the area of damaged tissue. Which, caused, which allowed for reperfusion of that damaged tissue, which ultimately stimulated new, uh, the endogenous or the, cell, the stem cells that were already in the heart. As I mentioned to you before, there are stem cells in all our tissues. It stimulated those stem cells to grow and to reform the heart. This was the, formation, this was the first patient who was treated with the stem cell therapy in Newcastle, where we performed that first study. And the question that was asked by the magazine, as you can see, was can Billy's heart regrow? And in fact, I think what we were able to demonstrate in all the patients that were treated was that there was some evidence of regrowth and also improved functionality. So obviously, we've been very keen to move these into other disease settings. Mesoblast is engaged with a company called Lonza, and they've built a purpose-built facility in Singapore. And you can see the picture here, which is a massive facility to enable the expansion of stem cells for therapy. And we now have clinical trials evaluating the efficacy of stem cells for the treatment of a range of different disorders from type 2 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and lower discogenic back pain. Um, 
This is a slide showing the various phases that the various trials are at. As you can see, many of them are in the final phases of clinical trial. And in fact, with our stem cells, we've treated in excess of 1,300 patients to date. We've also filed for approval uh, for treatment of acute, gross uh, acute graft versus host disease in Japan. And these, these studies are ongoing and uh, looking very positive. So those of you who remember this show, I grew up on a diet of the $6 million man. I'm not sure if anyone in the audience did as well. This is a, sh a show for you young people out there. It was in the 70s. Um, but they asked the question at the beginning of the television program, can we rebuild him? And I think from this, hopefully what I've tried to show you tonight is that certainly there are some elements of the fact that we can perhaps repair and regenerate tissues. And thank you for your attention. So the field expanded from uh, embryonic stem cells to stem cells that we find in us, fortunately. Uh, so finally, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Stan Gronthos to, uh, to speak to us. Uh, Stan is a professor in the School of Medical Sciences and is co-director of the Centre for Stem Cell Research based here at the University of Adelaide. During his postdoctoral training, Stan became a co-discoverer of several adult mesenchymal stem cell populations populations and inventor of protocols to isolate and propagate these cells from different postnatal tissues and as you've seen his role in in um, uh, in the activities of the mesoblast company have already been discussed he uh, like uh, andrew is uh, located at the south australian uh, health and medical research institute samri uh, where he's focusing on fundamental questions concerning uh, mesenchymal mesenchymal cell uh, stem cell biology Stan's current focus is assessing the efficacy of stem cell populations for regeneration of bone, cartilage, teeth, cardiac muscle and neural tissue. Please welcome Stan. Thank you Rob and uh, thank you for Andrew and Michelle for introducing stem cells and, and, and the lovely research that's been going on. Really what I want to talk to you about today is the advancements of stem cell research. We've heard from the, the two previous speakers in terms of what's been going on for the last few decades in terms of postnatal or adult stem cells and embryonic stem cell research. And, and really these stem cells are, have been fantastic tools for us to look at how development occurs and, and how cells go from a very immature state to a differentiation state. But there's issues with using these cells and limitations in terms of using these cells for therapies. So we've gone on to advance in, into different technologies and and this is not something that's happened over the last few years, but it's really taken 50 to 60 years to achieve. And it goes back to 2012 that uh, the Nobel uh, Committee awarded the prizes to, to two distinguished scientists, one for his work back in the 50s, and this is uh, John Gurdon, who really looked at them uh, in terms of challenge the idea that you can get, go from an immature state to a differentiated state, and really that's a one-way street, you can't go back. And, and he questioned uh, that process and said, well, we can take an embryo, we can isolate the nuclear material in that fertilised egg, basically, replace it with nuclear material from an adult cell taken from the same species, and allow that to grow and, uh, normally, and you get another individual that's identical genetically to the, uh, the cells taken from this individual here, and generate a functional individual. So this con concept of allowing multi-potency uh, to occur within the embryo stages led to uh, a revolution in terms of cloning and many species were cloned, and, and in 1996, indeed, the, the first uh, uh, large mammal was cloned, and, this, and you all probably be aware of Dolly the sheep that was cloned from uh, an individual adult cell, and, this, and that was a skin cell taken from uh, uh, one animal and create an identical genetically uh, animal. And this kind of technology went forward in terms of what is the mechanism of pluripotency? And is there a way of reprogramming cells back to an immature state and, and generating stem cells? And the pioneer in this area is uh, Yamanaka, who first identified what he called inducible pluripotent stem cells. Now he identified four factors. These factors are transcription factors or proteins that are within the, the cell that direct the expression of different genes. 
in, in the normal development of a cell and allow it to have cell fate, control cell cycle, the way cells proliferate and the decisions they make to differentiate into different cells. So he came up with a cocktail of these factors that when reintroduced into mature cells, taken from the skin for instance, uh, these factors could reprogram a mature cell into a cell that was like an embryonic stem cell state. So this was really revolutionary in, in terms of uh, the stem cell field. And with his work and, and that of John Gurdon's, they were both awarded the uh, Nobel Prize. But specifically, the, you could not only generate uh, a cell that was embryonic stem cell-like, you could show that this cell, when transferred into a modified embryo at the two-cell stage, and then implant that in utero, you could develop a whole new individual that was genetically identical to the original cell that was harvested. So this concept of induced pluripotent stem cells meant that you could really take a cell from any individual and generate an embryonic stem cell-like population. And indeed, this happened a year later after their first discovery. And in 2007, the same group, Yamanaka, and that of Jamie Thompson, who was involved in the embryonic stem cell work, showed that this uh, technology was uh, achievable in human population. They obtained a skin cell uh, from a skin cell puncture from an individual, grew those cells in culture, hit them with the different factors, as I've described, and allowed those cells to culture ex vivo, and these cells developed into embryonic stem cells. And they look, as Michelle showed, like an embryonic stem cell. So there's a cluster of cells that's originated from uh, one pluripotent stem cell on top of a feeder layer of fibroblasts. And these cells can form embryo bodies, which can give rise to the different germ layers of the tissue, the mesoderm, ectoderm, and um, ectoderm, sorry. <coughs> And these tissues allow the generation of all the known uh, tissues and organs in the body. So where are we now? In terms of uh, looking at the different stem cells available to us for therapy, we can do a comparison of the different stem cell types. So in terms of the embryonic stem cells, the tissue source is embryonic, so you have to destroy an embryo to obtain these cells. So there's ethical implications involved. Uh, the adult stem cells, along with inducible pluripotent stem cells, can be taken from any postnatal tissue. It doesn't have to be adult tissue. It can be umbilical cord, it can be uh, cord blood, it can be placenta, it can be deciduous uh, exfoliated teeth. So it can be taken from any cell postnatally. The real beauty of the embryonic stem cells and the inducible pluripotent stem cells is that they are pluripotent. Virtually they can generate any tissue in the body including uh, the gametes or sex cells as well. Whereas adult stem cells are quite limited. They can be multipotential as Andrew showed with the blood system but they're quite limited so a blood cell won't go on and form a neuron or a liver cell. The lifespan of these cells can be compared and uh, obviously the embryonic stem cells and the inducible pluripotent cell stem cells have a great capacity for generation of progeny and they can be maintained in culture almost indefinitely. Whereas the adult stem cells have a limited ability to proliferate and within 50 population cycles these cells usually undergo cellular senescence and die. So the advantage for having embryonic stem cells or inducible pluripotent stem cells is that we can generate lots of them. The immunogenicity issue so if you take an um, embryonic stem cell, grow it up, form a particular tissue, then implant that into an individual, those cells are not from that individual. So they can possibly elicit an immune response from the host to the, uh, the donor tissue. But if you use adult stem cells from an individual, uh, you can avoid the, uh, the problem with immunogenicity not only from the same individual, but e even from people who are HLA type matched as well. And uh, Andrew probably mentioned that the mesenchymal stem cells also have a capacity for immunosuppression of immune responses. So different adult stem cells can be delivered in an allogeneic sense, not only autologous. But the beauty of the iPS cells is that yes, indeed, you can generate 
uh, an embryonic stem cell-like population from the same individual and deliver those cells back to them. The big issue in this area is really the tumour formation. Embryonic stem cells, by definition, can form teratomas. Teratomas are basically a, a cancer that forms all the different types of tissue uh, in, in the body, can form teeth, hair, epithelial tissue when you analyse them. Adult stem cells don't form tumours. And I think we've probably, in our work alone, we've probably treated 1,300 odd patients and countless uh, other types of uh, preclinical studies in large animals and haven't found any tumour formation delivering both autologous and allogeneic adult stem cells. But induced willpower potent stem cells, because they're like embryonic stem cells, have that possibility of developing tumours. In clinical applications, both embryonic and iPS cells have to be induced to form a particular tissue whereas adult stem cells can be delivered and they are limited in their capacity and they know once they're in the right environment they can form the blood cells or the muscle tissue or the bone tissue. So you don't really have to direct them per se. So here we have a new technology, the inducible pluripotent stem cells, which offers a lot to us. But the way they generate it is by delivering these four genes into a, uh, an adult cell and forcing the expression of these genes which are normally shut down in the cell. And the way that we do it is using lenti and retroviruses. These are highly infectious viruses which are modified that can't replicate themselves outside of the initial infection. But what they do, they integrate into the human genome. They were very highly efficient at infecting the cells and expressing the, uh, the genes that they carry. So it's a great way to introduce these genes, get them expressed and convert any cell at high efficiency into, into an iPS cell. Other people have looked at, uh, but this is a problem where you're integrating not randomly into the genome which can cause mutations and could possibly theoretically cause tumours. People are looking at other technologies using RNA viral uh, uh, constructs, the RNA being the intermediate between DNA and protein that gets tr uh, transcribed from uh, DNA and translated into protein. So they're using uh, uh, viruses which are just built around an RNA molecule. And these are allowed to infect in and they don't integrate into the genome of the host. So they're only transient in terms of their expression, but they're on long enough to induce uh, pluripotency. Uh, people are using synthetic uh, RNAs as well. They're using DNA uh, constructs from viruses that don't integrate right into the genome, but kind of sit on the chromosome and replicate in unison with the uh, host cells, excuse me. And now uh, people are actually going forward with uh, different chemicals that change the way the genes are switched on and off and small peptides which can direct and mimic the four factors. So the technology is moving fast in terms of how we can convert these cells into iPS cells which makes it safer for clinical use. In terms of therapeutic utility, like I said before, you can take cells from one individual, from a skin puncher, grow these cells up, reprogram them, and you can generate any type of tissue for any type of condition and transplant that back into the patients. If, if the patient has a disease that is involved a, a genetic defect like a sick, sickle cell anemia or hemophilia, you can correct that gene in the individual cells and transplant that back to the patients. And whether these cells can be used for allogeneic cell therapies remains to be seen. Now, proof of principle study using iPS cells has been performed in animals where they generated a mouse with sickle cell anemia, which affects the red blood cells. And it involves a, a, a mutation in the globin gene. So these uh, mice were generated where they knocked out the globin gene in the mouse and, and replaced it with a, a defective human globin gene. And that uh, caused sickle cell anemia in this mouse. They took cells from this animal, grew them up, made iPS cells, uh, gen genetically corrected the mutation in those cells, 
and generated hematopoietic cells or the blood stem cells in the lab and replaced those into the mouse and these cells grew and the mouse uh, was relieved of the anemia. So basically it's a proof of principle study where they cured a mouse of sickle cell anemia using iPS stem cells and gene therapy. And now human cells uh, taken from sickle cell anemia patients have been generated and that gene has been corrected in those patients but hasn't been replaced in the patients yet. But the possibilities are there. So other possible uses of iPS cells, apart from generating all these diff different tissues, allows people to look at the disease. So you can take cells from a, a person with a particular disease or disorder, Parkinson's for instance, generate neuron cells. And then in vitro and in animals, you can look at the way the disease develops and look at the mechanisms of how this uh, disease develops. And not only that, but you can screen those cells and look at what drugs treat these cells? What's the toxicity of these drugs on these cells? So you can really tailor make therapies for individuals with different diseases using this technology. And indeed, uh, people have started setting up banks across the US, uh, across uh, uh, Asia and Europe in terms of collecting samples from different patients, generating iPS cells, and banking these for people to study. And this is just a short list of what types of diseases they are targeting. Now, a path to the clinic, and, and colleagues of mine in the US that I used to work with have looked at the idea of what should we be doing in terms of uh, making sure that iPS cells are safe, given how the, the, the field is moving so fast into therapies. And what they looked at is in a, a non-human primate model in the rhesus monkey, they isolated cells and generated iPS cells and transplanted them subcutaneously back into the, into the animals. And these uh, autologous iPS cells generated teratomas and there was some uh, inflammation response to those teratomas but there was a, uh, a reasonable frequency of uh, tumour formation in these animals. But what they found was that if they stimulated the cells to differentiate in culture prior to implantation, and in this case they uh, stimulate them to uh, de or differentiate into stromal cells or mesenchymal stem cells, and then implanted them into the animals, they found that the cells uh, produced no inflammatory response, they uh, produced no tumours, and they formed normal bone tissue. So this is really a, a lovely study showing that it is possible to convert a primitive cell into a differentiated cell and use it for therapy within the same individual. And indeed we're doing some of that work here in Adelaide with uh, Professor Mark Bartold at Dentistry. And what we've done is taken mesenchymal stem cells uh, taken from periodontal ligament cells in the teeth, grown up these mesenchymal-like cells, and uh, generated iPS lines. So as you can see here, these mesenchymal cells have been generated into iPS lines. They can form all the different germ layer cells as I've described before when you implant them into a, in vivo. And they start to express the uh, pluripotency markers like OP4. And some of these clones as they expand up uh, seem to have a normal carrier type or normal chromosomes, and they haven't had any translocations or any mutations. So these cells uh, seem to be embryonic stem cell-like, normal uh, carrier type, and they have pluripotency. So what are we doing with these cells? Well, our idea is to create a bank of iPS cells, expand these up, and generate lots and lots of MSCs. As I mentioned before, the problem with adult-derived MSCs is that they are limited in their capacity to proliferate, and we have to bank lots and lots of different donors and go through and check the quality control of all these donors. And depending on the therapies, it may not be possible to service all the different types of uh, diseases that we want to treat with adult stem cells. So we want to grow up all these iPS cells and then bank down what we call iPS-derived uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And as you can see from these iPS cells, we've differentiated the cells into fibroblasts again, and these cells can form fat and they can form uh, bone when implanted in vivo. They lose their markers for pluripotency and they start to express classical mesenchymal stem cell markers. 
and they also form tissues like fat, bone and cartilage in vitro as well, which are hallmarks of mesenchymal stem cells. So what we're looking at in these cells is can they regenerate not only tissues in vitro and, and, and in vivo, but can they also regenerate a, a defect? And what we've looked at is the, a, a critical size defect in the mandible where we've removed some of the bone near the, the molars and seen whether if we delivered the stem cells there, the IPS converted to MSCs, can we regenerate that bone? And indeed, we replaced the cells grew up these cells, so these are human IPS MSCs delivered into a rat model, and the rat model is a nude rat, so it has a compromised immune system which can tolerate the human cells. And what we found was when we just had defect alone, we found a few areas of uh, new bone formation over several weeks. When we looked at the vehicle alone, the vehicle being uh, a uh, clot which actually holds the cells together, so we just put that fibrin clot into the uh, defect area, it did indeed stimulate some new bone formation. But when we added the cells with the clot into the defect, we got a large area of new bone formation and we got some large area here of what you call the periodontal ligament tissue, which is really the connective tissue that holds teeth together to the bone and allows the movement of teeth as well. So this is uh, graphed here in terms of the level of bone formation identified in the cells plus clot versus clot versus the defect alone. So the cells exhibited the capacity to regenerate bone and periodontal tissue. And in these animals, we found no evidence of tumour formation. So what have people been doing apart from us outside in the world? What the, the first human trial has been started in terms of IPS cells. And this was done in Japan a, a year ago, where they started to recruit patients for looking at uh, macular degeneration, uh, where people, well, these people basically lose their eyesight over time. The first patient to be implanted was a 75-year-old Japanese, a 70-year-old Japanese woman with degenerative eye disease. And they took her skin cells, grew them up in the lab, generated IPS cells, and then using technology from Dr. Takahashi, who developed a way of programming the iPS cells to go become uh, uh, pigment cells or cells that can visualize color. And they used that technology to reprogram the cells back and differentiate them into pigment eye cells and then transplant them into the uh, eye of the same patient. And they're recruiting a few other patients, but what they're really looking at is whether the cells going into the eye can stop the progression of the disease, uh, is there any immune uh, rejection, and do you get tumour formation? So that study is ongoing. So I just want to touch on, and we'll probably talk about this later with you as a group, ethical dilemmas concerning iPS cell technology. Well, there is some, and uh, similar to embryonic stem cells, you can use these cells to regenerate a whole individual. So cloning is an issue, but that's different to therapeutic cloning. The other theoretical issue is whether you can form a human mouse chimera, whether putting these pluripotent stem cells into an animal embryo, can you regenerate tissue that's human? But does this tissue get integrated and form some type of hybrid animal, does it get integrated into the sex cells and can be passed down through the generations. So these are the theoretical types of dilemmas that uh, scientists are, and politicians are dealing with. But what's next? I've talked about IPS programming and it's a very exciting field. Uh, we've got the ability now to produce any type of cell in the body and potentially uh, treat any disease. But do we have to go that far? And really, we're looking at uh, transdifferentiation as another alternative, where we just use limited amount of factors that, say, if you're working on uh, Parkinson's disease and you want to produce neurons that for, uh, make uh, dopamine, then why not just deliver some factors which restrict the cell to revert back to a neuron or to differentiate directly into uh, a, a functional neuron or its progenitor? So these are the possibilities now. Do we have to go all the way back to an embryonic stem cell-like state and then come back and generate different tissues? Or do we just go from an adult stem cell 
to uh, a neuron or progenitor or some intermediate. So this is some of the exciting work that's happening uh, around the world uh, currently. And thank you. Thanks, Dan. So three, uh, three talks about some fabulous work that's been uh, going on here in Adelaide and other parts of the world. So I'd now like to invite our three speakers to join me up here for the uh, a, a, a discussion. And I get the, um, the pleasure of asking the first few questions, but you'll, you'll get your turn pretty soon. Uh, the first question I want to ask is, um, my, my uh, little boy who turned two just recently, when he was born a couple of years ago, we were offered uh, the opportunity to have his uh, uh, hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells frozen away for, for his life. Uh, I won't tell you what our decision was, but I'm curious to know do you think that is something that, that should happen? I think uh, it's, it's a good idea if there's a, a public uh, bank to bank them. I don't think uh, the amount of cells that you collect is therapeutic for a patient um, unless they get a disease very early in life. And the other thing is if they do get something like a leukaemia or a hematological disease, yeah, risk of putting back the same cells into that patient. So uh, my view is that if you have a, a bank of, um, a publicly available bank, that can service different people because you can use uh, various um, preparations for one person. But some of the work we're doing with mesoblasts is actually, and it's in a trial phase three now, is looking at mesenchymal stem cells in a culture flask and seeding them with cord blood and expanding that cord blood and using that preparation for cancer patients. Anyone want, anyone want to add to that? No? I, I think that was perfectly answered. And uh, But we have an eminent haematologist here, in Chris Yatner, <laughs> and this is a dilemma that, that uh, I'm sure he's encountered over the years as well in that this is a question that's often asked of haematologists. Do you store your cord blood cells? And the reality is, I think, as Stan mentioned, the idea of a public bank is an excellent one. To store them as individuals, there are risks associated with that in terms of, as Stan mentioned, you know, really having a potential um, a disease that you're storing effectively if your child encounters a disease later in life. So, Thank you. Um, Michelle, I wanted to ask uh, in terms of the uh, future of embryonic stem cells, do you think they, they have a limited life in the actual therapeutic use sense? Will they be replaced by uh, IPS and, and ad adult stem cells? Well, I think certainly the amount of research that's been done in embryonic stem cells has reduced since the IPS cells have come around in particular because they're very exciting and as Stan you know, sort of went through is you can, they, they seem to have many of the same characteristics of the human embryonic stem cells. They have the capacity of being able to take from yourself, which is really important. I mean, one of the issues that we have with, with, hum, with human embryonic stem cells is that they're not your own cells and so there is potential for rejection and, and things like that. So, but I think that there's still quite a lot of work being done around embryonic stem cells because we, one of the key things that we, that we know when you reprogram cells and what happens in the embryo during normal embryo development is there's a massive amount of epigenetic regulation. And that is really important in terms of the pluripotency of the cells and maintaining that in terms of their normal progression. And so that still hasn't been shown all that well in IPS cells, it's still an open question. Um, but you know, I think really the IPS cells were very exciting when they've come about and they've probably at least stalled some of the um, research and emphasis that we had in terms of human embryonic stem cells and particularly given their ethical considerations. Thank you. Um, Stan, I'm curious, what's the, the time involved in converting them to iPS uh, cells? If you start expressing those genes, are we talking minutes, hours, days, weeks? No, months? usually uh, the process takes anywhere from three to six weeks, depending on the cells, the efficiency of the transduction. And what, what happens is that once you introduce these factors, um, you, the cells get converted and then over time, those genes get shut down by the, the DNA machinery, genetic machinery of the cell. And then the pluripotent markers, and some of them are the same um, genes, are upregulated in that cell, the endogenous gene. So at that point, 
you can say, yes, these, these cells are IPS-like, and then you have to spend weeks and, and even months to test their pluripotency. So to generate a light and then test that they're genetically, chromosomally stable. So uh, it took us probably a good six to eight months to generate our first lines. The technology is easy to do, but it's just a, a laborious step, and it's really based on all the fundamental work that they did in the embryonic stem cell field. So that, that time would be required to get to a point where you could use them therapeutically? Yes, so, right, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, Andrew, you mentioned there are about 220 cell types that we have. How many of those can we actually recreate using any of these technologies? I, I, essentially all of them, through, through um, the fact that we can actually regenerate an entire organism um, uh, however, in the laboratory, like, uh, I meant, you meant specific cell, yeah, in specific, specific cell types. The, um, that's an excellent question. I don't have an absolute answer for you, to be honest. But certainly, from the in the context of the hematopoietic system, we certainly can, um, using uh, a variety of different techniques that we have in the laboratory, generate essentially all the cell types that are found in the blood system. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, there was quite a number there. Um, in terms of other tissues, certainly there is evidence that we can generate at least part way through the process. Some of our in vitro techniques are limited and that we can't, gen some t in some instances, generate a cell that resembles a cell that you would actually isolate from the body, for example. Did you want to add something, Stan? No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, I have a bunch of other questions here, but I think it's your turn. Uh, so I'll turn the questions over to you, our audience. Uh, does anyone have a question for our experts? Hi, my name's Mark. I've got, had AMS for 15, 20 years. Uh, looking at um, going overseas for um, treatment of the stem cells from uh, $15,000 to have the uh, uh, the umbilical cord um, stem cells, 200 million, uh, up to $150,000 to go to have the non ablative HSCT. Um, it's very frustrating, uh, and knowing that there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people in, in Australia who will do something and donate their bodies to say, hey, look, <laughs> just let's do something here in Australia. But nothing's happening. Why are we all forced to go overseas to get this treatment? because it's not happening here in Australia. How long do we have to wait? And is there any way in which we can be of assistance to you guys? Well, the, the, the issue is that uh, countries like Australia are governed by regulations in terms of any type of treatment. Uh, until you have clinical proof in the phase three study, a randomised large uh, study that's uh, well controlled and statistically shown to be proven, the uh, regulatory bodies and the government can't uh, uh, allow any type of therapy to go on. It's, uh, I mean, people can just uh, go to different countries and get treated for whatever they want. It doesn't have to be stem cell treatment. They can get treated with whatever they want. But if there's no regulation in that, then that's a, that's a major issue. So in terms of the work that Andrew and I have done, you know, we've had 15 years of research. We've had now t nearly 10 years of clinical trials, and some of those trials are coming to the end. But, you know, Andrew and I have waited almost 20 years for our basic research to get translated into clinical practice. And, and some of our work has already, where you can use autologous stem cells to treat uh, uh, bone defects. So the TGA has approved that technology based on the initial clinical trials. Uh, but in terms of the allogeneic cells that we use, they're still undergoing phase two and three studies. So, you know, it's with any type, like any type of therapy. You know, I know people want to get treated with different diseases and they see all these things coming up, but there are huge risks of going to places where it's not regulated major risks and, uh, to your health and, uh, and your pocket as well. Mark, um, we, we actually completely understand the, the frustration and certainly it's something that we have spoken to numerous people about um, and we've had discussions with people who have gone overseas to receive stem cell based therapies. Um, there are enormous risks associated with, with these types of ventures. We would caution you we would ask that you do a lot of homework before you consider it. Um, and we recognise that 
the frustration builds for people in dire circumstances, but we recognise also that there is a real requirement for us who work in this space to actually ensure that there is a safe clinical application of these stem cell therapies. So the, our, our, our footnote would be just be very, very cautious um, and recognise that a lot of them untested, they're done in very unregulated <coughs> circumstances and you just don't quite, quite know what you're actually getting. So please be cautious. And I'd just like to add that uh, one of the key factors in all of this is the pace at which we can do research. And, and, and one of the things that I'd uh, like you to do is to talk to politicians about supporting research. It is, it is crucial. And they have to keep being reminded that it's crucial. Any other questions? <coughs> Would you say more about spinal cord injury, please? And relatedly, is there any relief for post-polio syndrome? Yeah, there, 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 is a, there was an embryonic stem cell um, treatment which is looking at, uh, or oh, it's a trial, it's, a, it's an early phase trial looking at that. Um, there haven't been any in terms of iPS cells yet in terms of human trials. I think these are going to be um, something that's going to come to fruition in the next uh, decade, five to ten years, there will be certainly trials happening in, those, in that space. Uh, and there's a lot of research out there looking at different uh, neurological diseases as well, like Parkinson's. So I think, I know it's a long time to wait but it, for, for patients, but uh, in, in the context of things, it's going to be a very exciting times for those types of diseases where before there was absolutely no hope for treatment and I think this, this will give at least some type of improvement in the, in the next decade. Following on from that, um, um, my father and one of my uncles died of motor neurone disease and of course there was no treatment. Uh, so you've sort of answered one of my questions because um, they've told us that it ha will happen sometime in our family but we just don't know when. Um, so possibility for my, for my siblings is good. Um, but I've got early onset osteoarthritis and um, is there any possibility um, for that earlier than 15 years? Yeah, osteoarthritis, yes, there's cl currently clinical trials happening in that space so, and, and with um, adult stem cells. So. I think in the next uh, probably, what, two to three years, they should know whether these cells are, have any efficacy. Certainly we, we know with the mesenchymal stem cells they're fairly safe. We haven't seen any major adverse effects, but in terms of e efficacy, um, that, that remains to be seen. But the preclinical trials look very good and the early phase one trials look good as well. Um, good afternoon. Um, I have RP, which is a blindness, um, it's a disease of the retina and uh, I know there's three human trials going on at the moment, um, one in California, um, Brazil and Thailand. Um, I'm assuming that these are mesenchymal stem cells, the adult stem cells, bone marrow stem cells from the patient. Um, are these probably less effective and from what I saw tonight that it looked like the bone marrow stem cells, you weren't really discussing about them being in the retina? And um, are they less effective and is the IPS studies going to be much more advanced and are they, are they going to be happening soon? I, I just, um, I couldn't quite hear all of that question but what, what, I, what I could hear is that you said that uh, you were asking the question about whether bone marrow derived mesenchymal cells could be used for, for eye, a treatment for eye disease, did you say? Yeah, for retinitis, um, retinitis for pigmentosa, pigmentosa, yeah. Okay. Because, Look, um, from what you're saying, that they're not, but I understand that there's three human trials going on at the moment. So it seemed to be tonight, we were just talking about fat, sure. um, bone, but how do they translate? How does the bone marrow translate into more complex or yeah. more, more like part of the neural, like the, um, the nerve, central nervous sure. system? Sure, sure. So Look, the, the, the experience and, the, and, the, and the, certainly the um, data that we have is that the mesenchymal stem cells, while they can actually differentiate into a variety of tissues, what they seem to be is really a powerhouse of, or a factory that makes lots of different types of factors or proteins 
that stimulate endogenous repair. So while we're not, we, we, we have evidence for what we call differentiation towards, say, for example, a bone forming osteoblast, a lot of our evidence suggests that it actually stimulates the endogenous repair processes in the tissue that's diseased or damaged. So in the case of the eye, for example, we have had and run a small preclinical and a trial in the context of macular generation, um, and that's shown some positive effects. Uh, so, and, and that is largely because of the what we call paracrine effects of these mesenchymal stem cells, the factors they produce that really do the reparative process, or which stimulate the reparative processes of those stem cells and other cells that are already in, the, in that tissue. Hopefully that sort of answers your question. Uh, good evening. I'd just like to ask if you can tell us more a bit on our current knowledge of cancer stem cells and the potential use of this knowledge in treating cancer. I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, cancer stem cells is, is really a, a term or, an, an, or a notion to describe a, a cell that um, has immortality in effect, as, as do stem cells, they actually able to reproduce themselves. A cancer stem cell is, a, again, it, a term that's probably, in my view, and it's just my view, is probably misnamed or misused. Uh, a, our classical understanding of a stem cell is that it actually has that capacity to generate itself, um, so this self-renewal process, but then can also differentiate to, uh, it, to varying degrees to other tissues. Cancer cells generally don't do that. They actually have a capacity to just replicate in an uncontrolled manner. Um, so these, what, what it really speaks to is the characteristic of a stem cell in that they have proteins, they express proteins that are normally associated with a stem cell. For example, like a, an enzyme that is responsible for making sure our chromosomes are kept intact called telomerase. So cancer cells will express telomerase just like a stem cell expresses telomerase. So they do share common characteristics, but I, I think it's a term that I, I probably am not very favourable of, if that makes sense. Hopefully that answers some of your question. I'd just like to add, yeah, in, in the IPS field, I know that people are looking at whether they can generate, uh, isolate and identify these uh, cancer stem cells and generate IPS cells from those and use those as model populations in vitro and in animal uh, models to look at the disease, study the disease and, and look at drugs that may target those early stem cells which seem to be resistant to drug, normal drug therapy. Um, some of these are very dormant cells or have uh, different characteristics to the majority of the tumour that uh, probably uh, uh, allows them to escape different therapeutic regimes. So people are using the IPS technology to uh, look at cancer development. You mentioned earlier on uh, about the life of different uh, uh, cells and different structures of the body. Um, has any research been done into, say, uh, varying the, the natural controls that the body must have on the rate of regeneration of bones or, or whatever, so that you can actually regenerate bone more quickly? naturally, rather than introduce uh, stem cells or whatever, just use the body's own reproduct yeah, reproduction system more, more efficiently no, that, that, that's or more a, rapidly. That's a good question and people have used factors that cells uh, produce in the bone to stimulate uh, bone formation. Um, people have used biomaterials that have an osteoinductive uh, property that stimulate the natural or the cells within the endogenous cells within that bone defect to regenerate blood vessel uh, formation. But what we found was interesting with the stem cells that when we looked at uh, spinal fusion, for instance, when in the lumbar region, this, our stem cells seem to work fairly well in that, and also in the cervical bone in the neck as well. Whereas uh, a, a product which is made from these cells, which is a factor that stimulates bone growth and has been approved as a therapy in the lumbar region. Someone used it off the shelf in 
to, to, for, for neck fusion and caused aberrant bone growth and killed some patients. So the stem cells seem to know what to produce the right amounts and interact with the right cells in the environment to produce normal bone, whereas a factor can just have a, a huge response, cause a huge immediate response in the area which is uncontrolled. So there are ways, but we think that a cellular approach, and maybe in conjunction with biomaterials or, or different factors, can give you a better um, a therapeutic response and a safer one too. Okay, I'll take one more question. Um, my understanding may be out of date, but uh, I always understood that differentiation involved a lot of gene splicing and, and reorganisation of the chromosome um, at the different stages of differentiation. With the iPS cells, how does that affect their state compared to, say, an embryonic um, stem cell, which wouldn't have undergone the same sort of gene splicing? The way I see it is that you have all the genes are there, regardless of what the cell is. Uh, it's how they're shut down and how they're activated. So it's really having a conductor who conducts a whole large orchestra and you have a beautiful piece of music. If that conductor isn't doing their job, it just sounds terrible. So that's my analogy. But it, it's really a symphony of how genes are shut down and activated. And that symphony directs the production of proteins and other molecules that direct the cell in terms of how to grow, um, how to migrate, and don't always sit still, how to differentiate into this cell, into a fat cell, not a bone cell. So these are all complex processes, and I think the, the great thing about the embryonic stem cell IPS work and adult stem cells is really allowing us to look at how these processes occur at the molecular level. They're really tools for us as researchers. So, you know, our initial drive for the re was looking at the basic mechanisms of how these cells uh, grow and develop, but it wasn't really, oh, I want to use cells for therapy, so I'm going to study this. So it's really the drive of the, the basic research. All right, well, thank you very much for those questions. They were terrific. Um, I'll uh, close the, the evening now, but uh, first of all, by thanking, uh, asking you to join me in thanking our speakers. Now, I'd just like to finish by letting you know about our next Research Tuesdays event. Uh, just a fortnight away, on May 26th, we have an inaugural lecture from Professor Sandy Stacey. Professor Stacey is head of the School of Physical Sciences in our Faculty of Sciences. Sandy's lecture will focus on earthquakes, which is very topical given the recent events in, in Nepal. She will discuss the science of assessing and reducing the risk of earthquake damage. So if you haven't yet registered to attend, please visit our website uh, and do so. So thank you again for coming tonight.